And we are recording. Okay, I am uh, John Mercer, president of the Las Vegas Triathlon Club, and I'm uh, really excited about this uh, video conversation. And this is a sports science video conversation and in conjunction with the Las Vegas Triathlon Club. Uh, I'm really excited about this because it has to do with that fourth discipline of triathlon, and that's nutrition. And I don't mean to say fourth in terms of one, two, three, four ranking because nutrition often is the most critical part to being able to be successful in these uh, endurance events. I've got Ted Girard here, an ambassador with the Las Vegas Triathlon Club as well. Hey, Ted, how's it going? Good, good, really good. I'm excited for this conversation as well. Yeah, this will be fun. And I know you and I have talked a lot about different nutrition approaches. And uh, so it will be fun to get uh, an expert on here. And we've got uh, the pleasure of having Nicole Kiley uh, with us. Uh, she is a UNLV sports dietitian, and she works with our UNLV athletes to make sure that they are staying on track and uh, you know, eating correctly for each of their sports. And, and you work with quite a few different sports, so I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that. But how's it going, Nicole? It's going great. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you guys inviting me. Great. Well, it'll be fun. To get, and, and I got to go a little bit of a backstory. We first met because uh, I found out you are a, a sports nutritionist and you know, a lot of people know I've struggled with um, GI issues and uh, nutrition in these endurance events. And I just started picking your brain and you were just giving me some great pieces of information to uh, chew on, to think about and pursue. And uh, it was helpful. And it's really, it's hard to get through a lot of the nutrition information. So it's nice when you have someone you can talk to uh, with the knowledge and then, you know, you work with sports and uh, you work with athletes, and, and that's, an, that's a really important combination. So why don't we start off, and uh, why, don't we, why don't you just tell us what you do uh, with UNLV and what you do with the athletes and sports you work with? Yeah, sure, so um, in case anyone doesn't know, there is, in collegiate athletics, um, we consider them the student athletes, so they're, they're juggling a lot, just like you guys. So they've got their daily demands and they have their athletic demands. And so because of that, um, our performance team is very holistic. And so from my niche, we have kind of that medical piece. We have that sport performance piece. Um, and then we have um, just the wellness side as well. And so I kind of try to hit them at every angle. I work um, in, co in combination with our sports psychologist, our team physician, our MD, and he has sport fellows with him. We have um, athletic trainers on staff, so and a strength and conditioning coaches. So we're very, very holistic in that way. We have 515 student athletes, 17 different sports. Um, that includes our spirit squads. And so lots of variety, um, lots of different sport cultures and demands. And so that's really fun is, um, getting to know the athletes individually, connecting with them and what's important to them in their sport, and hopefully supporting them in their, in their training goals. Awesome. That's great. 515 athletes. 515. And how many other sports nutritionists are there? You're looking at her, all of them. Oh. Um, no, so that's what's awesome about UNLV is that we are fortunate enough to have an undergrad in nutrition and dietetics attached. And we also have a dietetic internship program. So I've been able to connect deeply with that population. And so I have a lot of um, undergraduate interns who work with me, as well as I serve as a rotation site for our dietetic internship program. Um, our academic side has been fantastic on the nutrition side of supporting me. So that's been a wonderful partnership. And also we have a hospitality program at a really, really good hospitality school. So um, as far as the culinary piece, uh, that's been helpful as well. That's great. So talk with us about nutrition advice because um, it, it really, there's a lot of information out there yeah. and uh, it, it's hard sometimes for an athlete to figure out where to start or who to listen to? How do you talk with your athletes about uh, how to filter through information and then apply it to what they're doing? Because obviously with 515, 
you can't talk with every every one of them right. every day. <laughs> Just right, you gotta, you gotta keep them in the you, fish. <laughs> you must be teaching them how to approach nutrition. So how do you do that? That's a great question. So the first thing that I always like to say, first of all, let me just say it is confusing. It's very, very confusing. And because it's um, a very research science right now, it's always evolving. And so with that new things that come out, we have to kind of process that and chew on it as a group. And so there's a lot of discussion. But the first thing I like to um, empower my athletes with, with is to encourage them to ponder who is delivering this information. Um, who is it? what is their goal and do they have your best interests in mind? That usually helps get you in the right area. Um, number two, does this nutrition advice complement all aspects of your wellness and sport performance? So we have your physical, we have your mental, emotional, and, phys um, um, and psychological, right? So we've got a lot of elements to your wellness. And unfortunately with nutrition, Sometimes we take a very black and white approach, a very data cause and effect approach, but that's not how we operate as humans. So for example, what I mean by that, if a diet is not sustainable, if there are certain elements that impact other parts of your life, that might not be for you. So that's important as well. Um, and finally, from really the nutrition side, I, I like to think of nutrition as kind of a a pyramid, but not the food pyramid. <laughs> um, in order of importance, your your base is is your foundation, which I'm sure we'll we'll get into today. The foundation is the day to day, your calories, your macronutrients, your total needs, and then as we work up our our pyramid, you know we focus on nutrient timing, and then at the very tip top, maybe supplements. But what I mean by that is when you're processing information, I like athletes to know what what part of that pyramid does that information fit in? Because I think that a lot of nutrition advice, we can get stuck on these little topics that feel very important when really, if we have some perspective, that might not be making the biggest impact on our performance, you know? So we don't necessarily have to focus on sometimes those finer details yet. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. No, that's great. And, and I remember one of the things you said to me is I was probably under eating a bit too. And it was a more of a broad statement as opposed to, no, you need to have more dark green leafy vegetables. And it was very, and, and so I think that's, that's a really neat way uh, to do that. So, so, so oh, go ahead. following up on, on what you said, how do we as athletes filter, turn that filter on, right? Because it, I think it's really difficult for just athletes to know, I guess, you know, where the information is coming from and know if it's credible or not. And that's a great question. Develop that filter. Cause I think, I think you're, you're spot on that filter is critical, but we're being marketed to like, I, John and I were just talking before this about our email. I can't tell you <laughs> how many emails I get marketing to yeah. me about this or this nutrition or this nutrition. Um, so how, how do, how does an athlete turn that filter on or learn or learn how to turn that filter on? Yeah. And without, Without being biased, um, I think that the education level and the credentials behind who you're receiving that information from matters. That doesn't mean that non-credential people aren't also qualified. They definitely are really, really intelligent people, but that's one easy way to kind of grasp. Um, and I think that... But let me jump in really quick because oftentimes the companies that are marketing to us have like a people with a PhD. Right nutrition that right. is, you know, the one that's saying this, right? So that is kind of a double-edged sword, right? It is. It is. I interrupt, but I think that's... No, you're, you're so right. And uh, there needs to be, there really does, in order to advocate for yourself properly, there needs to be a baseline of knowledge. And that's just the truth. Once you have a basic foundation of knowledge and a little bit of experience, that really goes a long way. And you can, over time, begin to fine-tune what works and doesn't work, you know? Um, if you've run multiple races, you know, certain areas that are challenging or not challenging. So you can kind of divulge some of that stuff. It's, it's hard. It's not black and white. It's an yeah. ongoing issue. And that's why it's so successful. That's why the supplement industry is so successful is because I mean, yeah, it's not even supplements all the time. It's just general like food advice too, right. That are, in, but there's always some, it's always, it seems like there's something hidden, some kind of hidden agenda. 
or hidden secret, like um, I've got the secret sauce to your success. Exactly. So going along that exact same line, um, is there, can you think of a resource, like maybe a course or something like that, that a, an athlete could take? Or do you, do you advocate for that? that? So to get that baseline, you know, like think about, I'm thinking about my wife. She's a banker, right? She all day long, i um, watching her work now that we're all at home. She's, you know, making deals and it's all money, money, money. But she, there's no nutrition. Like, you know, John and I are kind of in the, you know, we're in, we're in kinesiology. We, we're a little bit in the field. We have a little bit of a baseline. But right. if someone had no base to begin with, right? where should they start? Oh boy, that's a great question because the resources that I love have um, dietitians behind them. So the, what I mean by that is the reading might be a little bit advanced, but there's sound, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. If you feel like you're pretty confident, um, some free resources that are available in handout form. I absolutely love the Collegiate and Professional Sport Dietitian Association. It's CPSDA. They have educational resources, downloadable handouts that are, I think, um, very digestible for the average person. And they break it down into topics that are really popular. Um, macronutrients, inflammation, recovery, sleep, you know, that type of stuff. Grocery shopping tips. They have a lot of handouts that I think are really, really helpful. Um, also, our my governing body is called the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and they pump out a lot of articles and a lot of sport nutrition articles that, as well. It's called eatright.org. So that's, that's an area of opportunity as well. Um, I think those are two good places to start. And then, and truly, most of your dietitians, especially your sport dietitian articles, um, so the way that you would know that registered dietitians have the credential RD after their name. Um, most of that general nutrition information is going to be pretty sound. Um, you know, if you're going, if it's a specific diet, like let's call it um, very low carbohydrate, maybe keto or, you know, some of these other, maybe you want to stay someone more general to get started. Um, but pretty sound stuff for most dietitians, I'd say. Awesome. Thank you. I, 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 uh, as you were put a into the chat uh or onto on the facebook because I, I i've seen that site before too and it's sound it's um, you know it's it's in it's in my profession as well it's like there's a lot of outside noise but you there's there's some core areas and i think that's a really good core area for people to uh to gravitate towards so thank you great question all right so let's maybe take some of that information that that you have and can you talk a little bit about how you would work with an athlete, whether it be a, a, you know one of the UNLV athletes or maybe someone who maybe you may be consulting with, uh, how you set up a, a nutrition plan for a sport. Yeah, so that is not cookie cutter, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so without going into this great big description, this, I, I approach the person and their own unique needs. So how we would develop that, first and foremost, what is your goal as, as my client, right? What are you looking for, okay? That's gonna help me gauge um, how we trend the session. But how I develop a plan is a thorough understanding of someone's medical history, um, medications, lab, lab work, um, any injury um, history, any physical changes over time, um, have they had any weight changes, um, what's their relationship with food? That's huge, right? Um, the, the, the way people eat food, how they approach nutrition, how they approach their bodies really, really impacts the angle that I'm going to take with them. Um, and then through understanding their demand, their training demands, their life demands and their goals, then we can get to some of those um, more specifics where we might build out what I call more of a sample day more than a meal plan, frankly. Um, depending on the client's um, level of experience and knowledge, we might start very general um, and then each session build um, small goals incrementally. And I find that to be successful because then you can really know what works and doesn't work. If we overhaul everything at once, that's hard to really know what's working or not working. Um, but the more experienced an athlete becomes, the more specific we can become. Um, I tend to be a dietitian that 
finds a lot of success without really getting to very, very specific numbers. Um, I find that um, empowering people with concepts and principles allows them a lot of flexibility um, and empowers them to um, make decisions in the moment that best fit their situation. And that's very, very helpful. But, you know, when someone's peaking for a very specific race, right, that's different. We might get more specific in those certain moments of time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's great. That, that it's, that's the big 30,000 foot view. And uh, you need to have that framework to be able to start dialing into some of the details. If, and I, 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 go ahead. I was going to say this kind of speaks to Ted's, um, Ted's piece. This is a great way for athletes to know if what they're getting from someone is bogus or not. If you are able to go online and simply enter in your weight um, or weight goal or and your training demands, and then it spits out something templately wise, that might get you somewhere, but that might not be totally what looking for you. Now, if you're starting from zero and you're just like, I just have no idea how much carbohydrate to take. Hey, that's a great place to start. Um, but I think um, context is so critical to what I do. And so Typically, it takes a lot more than just the numbers. The numbers are kind of the app, mm -hmm. the stuff I'm doing in my head on the background. You know, I really, I really liked what you said about you know taking it slow. Um, you know, I, I always look at work with athletes. Is we can't just throw the whole kitchen sink at them, and um, it becomes very frustrating for them. Um, I heard a, a quote just recently. It was talking about, or someone talked about this, and they said, you know, it, it happens in human nature all the time. We want to make a big change, right? So if I've been sitting on the couch for a year or two or three, and say, like, okay, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to, I'm going to run for an hour. Right. Right. So they go out and they run for an hour and they destroy themselves. Right. Right. And maybe they can do that. Maybe they can do it. Maybe they can't, but that's not going to be sustainable. But if you start them out and say, hey, run for, run for five minutes and do that every day, it becomes sustainable. And then you can build on that. And I think nutrition needs to be that way too. I don't know if that's the concept you were getting at. You're, ab you're absolutely right. Um, the messaging is sustainable behavior change. Yeah. Um, I think that we're always, we're, anyone listening to this is obviously a very high achieving human being, okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of people would not choose this sport. <laughs> <laughs> for fun okay so that already says that we can stick to something and follow it right um we have a level of discipline and we're able to push ourselves so i don't think anyone in this group would disagree that if i told you i need you to eat this at this time that that we couldn't do that we could um but are we developing the skills to be sustainable are we developing the enjoyment around it to find what works for us. You get what I'm saying? It's all those soft skills over time that are so, so critical in sustainability. Yeah. All right, all right. so. I agree more, thank you. All right, so now I wanna jump into that a little bit because this is always something that I get a little confused on is a lot of times with uh, food recommendations, they say they, whatever, uh, avoid processed foods. Yes. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> I could okay, no Cheetos, I get that, no Doritos, I get that, no Pepsi. All right. But then I start going down to details and it's like, wait a second, how much our a lot of our food is processed. So thank you. Can you talk a little bit about what we mean when we say avoid processed foods? Thank you. And again, that's the black and right. Avoid or not avoid versus somewhere in between, right? Um, so the definition of a processed food is really anything that's been um, adjusted from its natural state, the way we found it, which I hate to break it to people, but that's a lot of our, even meat has technically in some form been processed, right? Now, obviously we have a scale of your processed foods, right? So let's, let's do a potato, potato, maybe a wedge fry all the way to a chip, right? So we're really um, processing that over time. Now, the concept behind, you know, that whole food approach is that foods in their natural state are not just the, the caloric content, but they have other beneficial properties that are, are important and critical for your health. So not just your, um, in the potatoes case, your carbohydrate and calorie, 
but it's got other vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and fibers because our body is a whole system that work intimately to keep us healthy. So it's really important um, to meet our dietary needs that we do have a variety of intake, lots of whole foods, absolutely. Um, but we are missing the mark as athletes if we think that we're supposed to be um, eliminating um, processed foods. And the reason is, is for endurance sports in particular, it is very, very difficult to meet the high volume of needs that you need in whole high fiber. I mean, that would just cause a, a digestive nightmare um, to get 500 grams of carbs from something like broccoli. That would never happen. Um, and so that there is a reason that um, processed foods exist. Um, and they can be leveraged very, very well and enjoyed, not even leveraged, enjoyed um, throughout that process and have performance benefits as well. Your Gatorades, your chews, your gels, um, starchy carbs that are dense, they help you get to that goal and a, a lot more easily. Oh, that's great. So something that endurance athletes try to do in prepping for a race is get to this mythical race weight. We have no yes. idea. Yes, I'm so is. glad you're bringing this up. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll let you talk about race weight as well. But but I, what I wanted to get to is um, should we, as as athletes training for these events, should we ever get to a point where we're hungry? That's such a great question. Um, it again goes, Ted, you're really hitting a lot today. Um, when you, <laughs> this, I want to do it now, right? Um, it, a lot of times I find, um, maybe not in my setting every day, like collegiate athletes, like pretty much collegiate athletes, like when they're in season, they should kind of be there already. But I find, um, people, um, sometimes pick up something like a marathon to also be something to help them lose weight or something, right? It's kind of like multiple goals. Mm -hmm. um, that can be difficult and we'll hit that in a second. Um, but when you begin to, and I'm just speaking, um, sticking with what we're talking about today, triathlons, something so high volume, so hard on the body, you absolutely with training are going to have an adaptation physically. That's going to happen. That's, that's the outcome of, of training, right? You're going to see body composition changes, um, better stamina, et cetera. But when we intentionally, um, during that training also overly restrict, um, to the point that we maybe are overreaching and we're not recovering chronically as well as we should, we really put ourselves at risk. And I oftentimes argue or challenge athletes, is that racing weight, if you're, if you're there but underfueled, are you actually getting the benefit of that racing weight, which conceptually makes sense. You're lighter, you have less, I mean, we all know the, the benefits potentially. Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be a really, really good self-assessment of what a true healthy weight is for somebody. Cause I think sometimes we just come up with a number. Um, and so there's ways of coming up with a number that might be more appropriate, but I say weight and body composition are the outputs. Those are the benefits or the, the changes that come. If you just as an athlete focus on the inputs, training your tush off, sleeping well, um, fueling adequately and fueling well, the outputs will come and whatever your optimal peak is supposed to be as John Mercer, it will be right. And then you have, maybe you enlist professionals along the way to help you tweak here and there. But I think focus on the inputs, the outputs will come. That's great. And, and yeah, my, my idea for race weight is what I weighed back in when I was 29 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a lot of people associate, uh, and this, this is my athletes uh, and this is all athletes when they race their fastest time. Okay. I raced, I competed my best that day. Um, what was I wearing when I went to bed? What did I eat that morning? And what did I weigh? There's a lot of imprints that stick with us. But the truth is as humans, we are way more complex than that. And I always say to my athletes, if you, how do you know you couldn't have done it even better if you were, if you're fueling right? Like, how do you know that was your best weight? How do you know? Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's open for discussion. No, that's great. And I was also going to mention now that I'm 56, not 29 anymore, <laughs> my idea of what a race weight should be is, has changed. Mm. So how, how, how do you talk with maybe the older athlete versus the younger athlete or maybe even something more saying into what you do of men versus women? Okay, so I think that there's a few um, key variables that help us kind of decide when we're self-assessing if we're in the right ballpark. Um, how's our performance, first and foremost? Do we have the stamina and strength to push, right? Because if we're feeling underfueled or, or chronically underfueled, we're a little bit weak. Um, but also if we feel like we're heavier than what we normally would be or what we should be, um, we also see those kind of changes. Um, what's your injury uh, history like? Um, do you have nagging aches and pains, which, John, I don't know, as you've gotten older, do you have more aches and pains than when you had when you were 29? <laughs> um, no, but you know what I mean. You know your baseline. Um, and if you have a little bit more than you're used to, that's, that may be a sign. Um, how's your rest? Are you losing lean body mass? quickly? Are you sore for more than a day or two? Is your soreness um, just kind of extending for three, four or five days? Um, other areas that really can be a sign of underfueling as are actually our, um, our, our drive, um, feelings of motivation, feelings of um, burnout are sometimes signs that we're really not hormonally there. We're not hormonally recovering. Um, if we get any lab work, those are some um, metrics that can show us physiologically what's going on. So I think there's a lot of um, ways to see if we're in the ballpark there. That, that's great. You know, uh, I think this is a great topic because I think so many triathletes and endurance athletes struggle with, uh, with weight and with um, under fueling. And, uh, you know, even me, me personally, I've, I've definitely dealt with it. And uh, one of the things that I've done, and I think you, you started talking about this right in the beginning, is, um, is uh, really addressing the underfueling. And like when I'm training hard, I'm actually fighting to eat more now. You know, like I'm, uh, like I'm just eating all day. But if I'm training two or three hours a day, like it, I still, I, I'm struggling to get, you know, 4,000 calories. I know that sounds ridiculous. But 4,000 calories is, is not abnormal or... Oh, it's not. Oh, no, you're not hearing me flinch. I was thinking, yeah, it's hard to get there, but you need hard to get, to get it. It's, And I think you hit it right on the head when you said, you know, the, the processed foods play a role. Like, I, I hate to admit it because it sounds really bad, but I eat jelly beans on, when I'm on my bike just to get... Why is that, that, that's, that's, hey, that's one of my nuggets. Yeah. That we're okay. going to talk yeah but, but if i but, but when i'm at um when i'm at whole foods and i'm buying jelly beans i'm like looking around like <laughs> you know hey, break the stigma break the stigma i know right because i need those i need those calories right yeah. i'm getting only four calories per jelly bean and i'm eating like maybe <laughs> 20 an hour on the bike and right. but, I'm, but i'm putting out 600 or 700 calories when i'm training and plus I, daily needs plus, plus, my, plus my daily needs and honestly like I have to, when I, when I finish the day, like I'm struggling at the end of the day to get more food in when I'm training hard. That might be a strategy we talk about today too. Um, cause that's, that's something easy, but I also want to hit the, the gender piece, the male versus female. Yeah, so, um, in my field, there was, um, a previous, um, diagnosis, if you will, called female athlete triad. Um, that's since been revised. It's, uh, we now call it red S or reds, relative energy deficiency in sport, okay? Essentially, the concept here is in chronic under, with chronic under fueling, okay, we see impact on all systems of the body, um, digestive, um, immunity, bone health, hormonal, and we see it in men and women. It's just easier sometimes to catch it in women because there typically tends to be a loss of menstruation um, coupled with it. So that's kind of a first, first layer. Now, with regards to different nutrition needs, 
we can get really granular. There are different needs that I think that would be hard for me to verbalize with this group. There's just some research that's very exciting to see the specificity difference, but I will note that um, most research is done on males. Um, so there, there's more coming out with females, but unfortunately a lot of females go off of males when we have um, different menstruation cycles that greatly impact inflammation in the body greatly impact protein needs carbohydrate needs at different phases so that's more to come i think um but in general fueling adequately is really really critical for both men and women um the only micronutrient that i think is important as well to consider micronutrient being a vitamin or a mineral is iron so iron um, helps us transport oxygen to the tissues very very important for your sport and um what we see with um, running or impact, um, that kind of heel strike is you're actually breaking red blood cells down. And so you're losing iron potentially. So that's one reason why endurance athletes um, are at a higher risk for low iron or anemia. Um, female athletes, because you have a menstruation, lose even more iron. So that's one difference potentially. Now, obviously postmenopausal, maybe not so much, but that's one consideration. So do you think that, you know, let, let's pivot a little bit to, to iron, because obviously there's iron overload as well. Right. So would, would you say that, you know, before someone was to really focus on iron, that they should do some blood work? I really appreciate you saying that and catching on to that. Yes. So iron is one of those thing, uh, minerals that you cannot, you cannot get rid of it. So yes, overload is possible. So if you suspect um, that you're at risk, Yes, it, it's part of your um, annual, it's covered on your insurance, an annual blood work. Um, you'll want to do a few different markers, your hemoglobin, your total iron, your iron saturation, and your ferritin levels. So there's a few ways that we can look at iron status. And so your, your physician will know that. That's basic. If you tell them you're an endurance athlete and I need to know my iron status, they should pull those. Absolutely. Right. Um, before you go super dose a uh, 65 milligram three times a day, please. Well, I think historically, people have done that in endurance, right? Because they, 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 once again, they've read somewhere, oh, you know, iron helps with the transportation of oxygen. So, well, I want to transport more oxygen. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm an, an aerobic athlete. So then, right. they, then they start mega dosing as iron. And next thing you know, they're basically rusting themselves from the inside out. And if you guys want to know, um, iron rich sources, <laughs> First and foremost, your meats, chicken, fish, poultry are the most bioavailable. If we get iron, and that's your heme iron, so it absorbs very well. Your non-heme iron comes from your plant sources, so, you know, beans and grains and things like that. Um, they're not as well absorbed, so coupling that with like a fruit or vegetable that's got vitamin C helps elevate that percentage of absorption, um, but we will not see an overload from food. Your right. body's able to self-regulate in most cases, um, food. So um, definitely, as an endurance athlete, you need lots of protein and iron um, within that protein as well. Awesome, that's great. So the, 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 going off that, and also something you said earlier, let's say you know you're done with your workout that day, and you're you just finished dinner, but you still have that that hunger and some cravings you know, as a, you know, just habit, you end up reaching for whatever you're right. used to eating toast yeah. or chocolate or so. How do you train your athletes to reach for something that is going to help them recover and, and be ready for the next day? That's a great question, John. So I want people to know that there's different ways of looking at, at hunger. There's, um, hunger which is physiological hunger and then there's appetite which is the drive to eat or the desire to eat um, and then there's fullness physical fullness and then there's satiety i am satisfied right so there's an emotional and physical component to both of those or psychological and, and physical um if we are physically hungry in most cases and i find this um very very common among my endurance athletes particularly in my swimmers um, most athletes train early and they train hard. And so they tend to be under fueled earlier in the day and then playing catch up. Right. So I call that backloading your calories. 
you're catching up. And then the second half of your day are most of your calories. Um, so instead of um, just focusing on um, like training them to figure out the best meal, which we, we definitely, um, I provide options for sure. I first look at the global day and see if there's any trends on their intake. Are we kind of low and then having these big spikes of caloric intake later in the day? And we provide some education on the benefits of fueling your activity more consistently. Um, but yeah, so as far as nutritious options late in the evening, um, you know, the evening is a wonderful time um, before bed to, to push another high quality protein. There's a lot of nice research to show um, better muscle protein synthesis overnight, um, better like hormone recovery um, during sleep as well. Um, so some bedtime proteins could be, I mean, some people like deviled eggs or beef jerky. Some people just do like a little bit of leftovers from dinner and, and do what they would call like a mini meal, take a few, few extra bites. Um, you know, with your guys training volume, you could think of a sandwich or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, your carbohydrates, if you train hard the next day are going to be important to continue to replenish your carbohydrate stores, um, throughout your tissues. Um, so that could be fruit, that could be bread, that could be, I mean, you name it, um, you can do it. And then I think a great element to the night snack, which is harder to do around training, is the fats, um, the anti-inflammatory fats. Um, to, to talk to Ted's point about how to get to those high calorie needs, fats are, are where the magic's at. Um, they're double the calories per volume, um, they're easy to digest, and they're, they're very, very tasty. So think nuts and trail mix and nut butters. So at night you could do um, maybe a Greek yogurt with almond butter and fresh fruit on top, right? Um, or a big oatmeal bowl with nut butter and fruit and granola or something like that. Um, I think there's a lot of options, but the fats are, are really fun. That's great. Now, I've actually been putting avocado in my shakes. Love it. That, that's actually been good. So dr protein drink at night or stick more with something more naturally uh, occurring, if you will? I think it depends, right? If you're, if you're feeling like the, it's first of all, Friday, most of us usually are low on groceries on a Friday night, right? You're kind of okay. running out of options, but you really feel like you need some protein and it's convenient. Sure. Oh. Sure. Or blend it into a smoothie, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and add some things to it. Like you just said. Um, but some natural protein sources, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, eggs, beef jerky. Um, you could, do, some people are into like, um, tofu and like make tofu puddings. Oh, and, I, like I mean, people get really crazy with it. Um, I think there's options. I think it's important to not set rules around yourself and find what works for you. That's awesome. Yeah. I like the tofu idea. That, 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 <laughs> just nice to have those handy options around because and there's bars, no yeah right like if you like a certain protein bar i mean go for it that's so, great okay oh go ahead ted yeah so this is awesome awesome information and i love the fact that you're very mainstream right so there is um you know obviously a lot of talk and a lot of we're being inundated with information about uh low carb high fat diets so you, you made mention of fat, which I am a big fan of, and you made mention of carbs, and which I also am a big fan of. <laughs> um, where do you see the endurance nutrition world heading, uh, heading next? Because obviously things are continuing to, to evolve. Um, yeah. What's your sense of, of, of where we're heading? I know, it's a, I know it's a tough question. To it is. I'm this. trying to figure out how to verbalize that in a very simple way for, for the context of, of this group. Um, so I follow pretty heavily our Olympic sport dietitians and who work with, you know, high, high, high level endurance athletes on a regular basis. Um, it is from my knowledge, um, and I'll just say very low carb, I'll go very extreme really quick that there really hasn't been shown to be a, a performance benefit versus carbohydrate being available, okay? Um, now, we absolutely see um, physiological adaptation with changes in substrate, should I use that word? Um, and, and that's a little bit um, harder to explain right now, but essentially, 
Um, when your body doesn't have, you know, say carbohydrate available, it, it looks for other things. Um, so I think there's periodization in training and there's absolutely periodization with nutrition. And if you're working one-on-one -on -one with a professional and they can figure out your advancement, I think we can play with some of that stuff for sure. My hope where it's going, my hope is, um, to the stuff that really isn't the sexiest. And the truth is, is real food isn't sexy and um, balanced, sustainable nutrition isn't the sexiest and it doesn't make a lot of money, but that's where I hope it goes because that's what I believe in. <laughs> yeah, and, and honestly, I think long-term, that's the most sustainable. It is. And, and I encourage people, you know, if you feel confident, try something, try it. You know, you'll know quickly if it's working for you or not. Yeah, for sure. Um, I tried uh, the LCHF uh, diet for uh, five weeks and I lost a lot of weight um, and felt terrible um, and uh, would not do it again. I can tell you, I can, I can, I can tell you that it was, it was not a good experience uh, at all for me, but that was, you know, I'm an N of one and I went a little bit too, too crazy. I was doing like 50 grams uh, a day. That's low. That's very low. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and training, you know, um, so that was definitely a mistake, but I think that you're right. I think the periodization is, is, is good, but you really, I think you have to work with a professional if you're going to get you into, do. into that. You do. And I think that um, just general education, I think when we read a label and we see 20 grams of sugar, we, that, that number just sounds like a lot, but we don't know where that comes from. Like that's kind of where the general education comes in. I think knowing that as an endurance athlete on a very low day, you probably need 300 grams of carbohydrates on a Ironman race day, it might be seven, 800 grams. Like just processing how much that actually is helps you have perspective when you're looking at a 15 grams of sugar. It's nothing, it's yeah. nothing, so. Yeah. yeah, and we're all you know guilty, I think, of, of, of really now paying attention to, to sugar content. Right. Uh, because I, I think that there is, you know, it's been vilified. And, uh, you know, we tend to, as a society, vilify um, mi micronutrients and macronutrients, right? Because obviously fat was vilified in the 80s. Carbohydrates are vilified now. I'm sure protein is next on the, on the, on the chopping. I don't, I don't think protein's ever on the chop. Actually, that's not true. The vegan a, we, I was gonna say, we do have a little flavor. Yes, you're right. So I, I, I do think, I, I love the fact that you have this more, like I said, more balanced uh, approach. Because I think that honestly, it's critical and it's sustainable for, for, for this population especially. So let me ask you a, a question about a vilification and um, one area that I think has been, and maybe I'm wrong with this, but this is a question that I've, I guess I've always had is on, around sodium. Great and, question. Um, you know, as a society, we vilified sodium, right? Because of its impact potentially on blood pressure. And if someone has high blood pressure, that's a way to lower blood pressure, but not necessarily, doesn't necessarily work the other way. If you have low blood pressure, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily going to raise your blood pressure. And if we do try and eat whole food diets, we're missing out on a lot of the processed food where most people do get sodium. We're training in the desert. Great question. Yep. So where do, where do you fall on sodium for endurance athletes? Yeah. So even for general um, pop, um, I would argue that that sodium piece is actually somewhat out of date. There's not, there's not as many, um, sodium or, um, people aren't as salt sensitive as we um, initially thought. Um, so, you know, I think it's important for everyone on this call to know um, you, you've got calorie needs and in those calories, you have your macronutrients, your protein, carbs, and fats, right? That's your energy. But you also have hydration needs, um, your fluid needs, and that comes with water and then electrolytes. Sodium being one of the most critical electrolytes um, for muscle contraction, um, and sustained performance. And every time you sweat, you're losing salt. Um, this is wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up because it's so, so critical. And it actually is, is not just important for rehydration, um, but I, I did a little bit of research in this area because this isn't totally my bread and butter. Um, I don't exclusively work with ultra endurance. So I had to do a little bit of rating before I got on here. Um, and I, I came across some great stuff that I want to read. So obviously, um, 
in a race, I think some, John, you kind of said, I have experienced some gastrointestinal issues, right? Nausea, vomiting, you know, sometimes diarrhea, things like that. Not you, but that's, that's a, that's a very. I've had it all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, a very common thing. And so when we're talking about rehydrating and replenishing what we're losing, um, we need things that digest quickly, that leave the stomach quickly, and then also get into our, our, our cells and our body quickly. And sodium is really, really important for that piece. Um, and it actually, um, sodium being present can help us actually absorb water more quickly as well. Um, and so to answer your question short, Ted, um, we absolutely need salt. Um, and for your sport, we need it in the larger amounts than are traditionally in those sports drinks even. And so people need to be really hyper aware of the signs of what's called hyponatremia or low sodium. Um, people need to be hyper aware of if they're really crusty, salty sweaters, um, and potentially, potentially trial different concentrations of salt through training and seeing what works well for them. Um, because I have um, on my notes, um, you know, if you're doing like a race for four to six hours, you're losing a thousand milligrams of salt per liter, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot. Yeah. And so the typical um, average American recommendation is 2000 milligrams or less of sodium per day. Um, you will die. You would literally die um, at, in an Ironman if you were restricting to like 1500 milligrams and then racing. So that's something very, very tender that we need to ponder for sure. So I've, I've read quite a bit on this too, because I, you know, I'm super interested in this and there's also, you know, you read about, you know, acute hyponatremia, but there's also chronic hyponatremia that over time, your body will, you know, make, make significant changes to, uh, to various organ systems, mm. various systems in your body. Um, the other thing that I think is important for people to know, and this is just from my reading and I, and I hope you'd agree with this, is that when you do blood tests for sodium, they almost always come up normal. Right. Because our body preserves sodium in the blood, number one. Everything in the blood. Blood, Every, is, every, blood is gold, yes. Exactly. So you, know, you go, you get your blood work done, and you get, oh, you know, like a 140. Um, I think it's millimoles per, I, didn't even, I can't remember the. You're right. The sodium, millimoles per deciliter, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it comes up, it's in the normal range. And it's like, okay, well, it's low normal, but it's still normal. Um, but you're, you're preserving that. You're not, you know, you're, you're thinking, well, I'm good, but you're really not. And I think that spe especially people living in the desert and uh, you know, we have to really be very conscious of that. So thank you for, for addressing that. And I'd also like to note with that, um, you know, iodized salt, so your table salt, um, comes with a critical nutrient called iodine, which is really, really important for thyroid function. A lot of our trendy salts right now, like Himalayan salt, sea salt, those are great too, um, but they don't have iodine. And so unless you're eating a, a large variety of fish, you could be playing with your thyroid a little bit and becoming deficient. So that's, you know, iodized table salts is great. We don't have to villainize that just because Himalayan sea salt, you know, the pink salt became popular, which it is, it's great, but um, don't be scared of that kind of salt too. Yeah, I agree with that too. It's interesting, right? Like we, we, we get on these little, little kicks and trends and we don't realize that, you know, there's actually good, uh, there's good things out there, right? Yeah. Um, the other one I would like to jump on here if we can, and uh, um, was actually vitamin D because it actually falls under something very similar, right? Because a lot of the foods that are not trendy and cool are the things that are fortified with vitamin D, right? It's not cool to have um, cow's milk anymore. You got to have almond milk. Um, you know, you may not have uh, breakfast cereals, which are also fortified with vitamin D because, you know, that's processed food. And, you know, it's not cool to get a sunburn, right? So we cover ourselves completely <laughs> up all the time. And I'm a little bit tanned right now. But um, so I think that vitamin D status is another one that is, is it can be tricky uh, to get it right. Would you like it to is. comment on that? Yeah, so vitamin D, first of all, it's, it's called the sunshine vitamin for a reason. Uh, it's meant to be, we are meant to get our vitamin D from the sun. And there's a widespread of insufficiency and deficiency right now. And that's why everyone's aware of it. For many reasons, you alluded to, to, to one, um, you know, we, we put sunscreen on, we might be working indoors. Also the latitudes 
uh, um, impact how we absorb vitamin D, skin pigmentation um, impacts um, how we um, absorb vitamin D or how quickly I should say, as well as age. Um, foods that have vitamin D, um, fatty fish, dairy, like you mentioned, and some fortified, and, and they are really, really important. Um, it is hard to get the level of vitamin D that I would recommend just through food. Um, we feel, uh, I'm sorry, our sport performance team and, and most dietitians at this point would say that the research shows your vitamin D level should be between 40 and 50 is optimal. Your range on lab values is, is actually 30 to be a cutoff. Um, so to get there, I vitamin D is kind of one of my staple supplements. Um, again, I would like people to get lab work, but that's something that um, I have a lot of people, I recommend for a lot of people is a vitamin D3, which is the active form. Now, again, that's a fat soluble vitamin. So you don't want to go out there and take 10,000 IUs and just go for it for endless and endless amounts of time. You want to be under the care of a provider, but um, vitamin D has been linked to, we're finding receptor sites all over the body. So um, you know, muscle function, immunity, bone health, um, lots of vitamin D is a really full system approach here. So um, very important, very important. I'm glad you brought it up. I, I've heard you re referred to as the um, hormone vitamin because mm -hmm. it is that critical to us. So thank it you. It is. Go ahead, John. So uh, hopefully that, that is my uh, ice cream craving uh, sort of fits that vitamin D supplement, but maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> maybe more sugar in that. All right. I want to go back to a term you used earlier. You said periodization of eating. And I've heard this term a lot. I am guilty of eating the same thing on a regular basis. <laughs> Monday is capriati. You know, Breakfast is, you know, eggs and toast and, and what have you. And I get into a routine. So when you use the term peri or the phrase periodization of, of eating or nutrition, what, 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 do you, what do you mean and how can we apply that for as athletes? I think in simple terms, it's being aware of the times that training volume or intensity is increasing and being aware of the times where it might, you might be resting or recovering, right? In different seasons. Um, and then understanding that with that increase um, comes an increase of nutritional needs, right? Calories first and foremost, um, but second is gonna be your protein and your carbohydrate, things that are really critical, carbohydrate being for performance and protein being huge for recovery, obviously they kind of interchange actually, now that I'm talking out loud. Um, but I think that the general approach is just being very aware of that um, and having that um, foresight to fuel appropriately for that. Um, now, if you want to get very granular, that's really where we can build out more of that meal plan to make sure that you're kind of peaking at the right time that's hard to kind of dive into specifics but no, that, that's, that's great because it actually last week we were talking about training peaks and before the call uh we were talking about training peaks and trying to monitor your intensity level and your training stress score so that's really what we need to be doing is monitoring that uh, output that we're doing but then making sure that our nutrition plan is adjusted uh, and as i think along. people would be shocked as to how well the body adapts and with as active as you guys are people would be shocked that the body could literally keep using more and more and more if you give it what it needs it will learn to use it just like if you give it less basal metabolic rate will drop and it will learn to do what it needs to do with less mm -hmm. um, and so i challenge people over time to give it a little bit more and see how you feel Oh, that's great. And, you know, when we were talking about uh, nutrition for iron distance events, uh, and, and you started down this path earlier, too, you were really good at, at saying, John, make sure that you have a hydration plan and a nutrition plan. Uh, so could you speak to a little bit of that? Like, how do we approach, how do you approach that with your athletes in terms of making sure that they're, they're drinking the right amount, but then also having the right nutrition plan either during an event or regular your know, day-to-day plan yeah that's it's hard it's a it's a lot man and and even me being in it it's like overwhelming so i can only imagine when it's your body and it's and you don't feel like you know um 
one great way to approach I mean, you got to train your gut. You got to know what works for you. And I definitely would say you want to know that well before uh, race day. Um, the hydration piece is a, actually should be something that's very, very predictable. Um, you know, we have what's called a sweat rate. And you can actually monitor your sweat rate during training. And a really practical way of doing that is um, weighing yourself before training, weighing yourself after your training. Uh, let me just put it in simple terms. So if I ran for one hour um, and I weighed 200 pounds when I started and I weighed 198 after I start, after I finished, um, that's two, I had a two pound weight loss, right? I didn't lose weight during that training. I lost fluids. Okay. So I lost two pounds of fluid for each pound of fluid loss. It's about 16 ounces. Okay. Um, so let's say I had a 32 ounce deficit, but I drank 32 ounces also while I trained for that hour. So really, I lost 64 ounces in that hour, mm -hmm. okay? So if my goal moving forward the next time that I, you know, trained for an hour was to maintain my hydration status and not become dehydrated, I would want to... Um, adjust my hydration, knowing that I need 64 ounces, I would break that down. And that's how you would kind of build out your hydration plan. Okay. And there's a lot of trial and error in that over time of what you can tolerate. Is it in 15 minute increments? Is it five minute sips? Everyone's got their own kind of system there. The nutrition plan as well, um, I think is very, very customized. And I think that that really, um, you should be able to hone in on before. What's hard is your race is your peak, right? So you might not have gone that distance in training. So you have kind of an idea, but when all systems start to fail, <laughs> what, what are you tolerating well? And I would love to hear from you guys how you've adjusted your fueling plan over time. I think the keys that I always tell my athletes is don't change it up. Know that um, things like caffeine, um, that sometimes give you a perk in training can really have detrimental effects at, at these ultra events. Um, we can get some fatigue with some of these gels, uh, you know, it's trial and error, but I would love to hear what you guys do from your fueling and hydration plan. Go ahead first, John, I'll, I'll let you go and then I'll, I'll try. Uh, well, I actually, I, I'm going to, this, this might be a place where we want to, uh, say we need to do a whole nother call on this yeah. because um, True. We, we could go for hours. It, well, it, it's amazing. We've been talking for an hour right now and it just flies by and I still have a long list of questions <laughs> to get to. So, uh, and what you, the, the question you ask in terms of what we do, it, it's, it's a great question. And it's, um, I, I think, if you heard my answer and you hear Ted's answer, you might hear something quite different. And now we've got to figure that out because I, 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 as you know, I haven't fully figured out my nutrition plan for iron distance races, even though I've done enough of them. I, you think I'd know by now, but every race is a little different in terms of heat, humidity, temperature. So many variables. Yeah. So many variables. You know, where I'm at, uh, it, it, it's really uh, complicated. And, uh, but that's what's fun about talking with you about this is trying to, trying to zero in on some different things to try. I don't know, Ted, do you want to throw something out right now? Or, or? I'll ask you something really quick. And, and, and I'm going to piggyback exactly with what you said. The variable of the race plays a huge role into it, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nicole, I mostly do half Ironman racing. So it's four and a half hours is about my, my, my goal times. So it's a little bit different, but there definitely has to be a plan. And um, there has to be a plan based off of conditions. How hot is it? How humid is it? How much climbing, for example, on the bike is there? Um, how much climbing in the run, like how much effort I'm going to put out. Mm -hmm. But these things, it, it is, it's a, always a moving target because if it's 90 degrees and 70% humidity and I'm racing in Florida, it's completely different than 60 degrees and very little humidity somewhere in the desert in the winter. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that's important. The one thing that I, that I've done that I'd like to add just before we end 
is, and I think most of you know this, you can do this, is you can actually measure your kilojoules burned on the bike. So it's another thing you can do. So you can go into training, for example, and do an hour, almost like you're talking about with the hydration. So do an hour of your pace that you're going to race at, right? So if you're gonna do an Ironman, you're gonna do a five hour bike rate ride, you can take out one hour of like that exact pace or that heart rate or whatever you're gonna do. And you can pull out how many kilojoules and from how many kilojoules is, is very close to how many kilocalories, right? And you can actually determine how much you're, you really are utilizing per hour and then see how, you know, see where you're actually at. And, and we, I think we'd all agree that uh, you can't eat enough to make up that deficit, mm -hmm. right? So more often than not, it's just getting to the point where you can tolerate enough of the calorie more than anything else. And that's something that we should definitely talk about next time is the toleration piece. Do we go mostly liquids? Do we incorporate some solids? Yep. What are the benefits of the different mixtures? There's a lot of science there. It's very individualized, um, but it's, it's good. Well, if you'd, if you'd uh, be willing to join us again uh, down the road, we'd love to have you. This has been unbelievable unbelievable it's been so good oh it's been so fun i can't believe it's an hour at first when john said he wanted to talk an hour i was like oh god i don't know <laughs> i hope i have enough juice for him but we've got a lot a lot to do so yeah no and i'll, I'll quickly add ted um you know uh I, I obviously you know on your cycle computer you you can put kilojoules showing up on that display which is really helpful and kilojoules you're right they almost work out to kilocalories so if it shows 2000 that's how many calories you're you're using for that ride yeah and i love to do it just for an hour like at my race pace whatever i'm going to race do a one hour and then you can multiply it right it's it's quite easy to see and when it comes up and it says you did 800 calories for that hour and you're like wow 800 calories and you start thinking about it, that's a that's 200 grams of carbohydrates mm -hmm. right and yeah. It's hard to get 200 grams of carbohydrates in. Actually, it's, it's pretty much impossible, right, Nicole? Nothing's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, I tried and I can't get 200 calories in, or 200, 200 grams of carbohydrates. Oh, well, I can help you. That's, my, that's where I come in. All right, good. So let's, 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 let's table this to the next top. We yeah. can start off with this. This is great. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I have made, the, that was one of, one of the many mistakes I've made nutrition-wise during a race is taking in too many calories, and then all of a sudden, my gut shuts down. Uh, so, yeah, this is, I, I would love to pick up on this. This is so great, Nicole, that you've made yourself available for this. You're such a great resource. Uh, you know, the, the expertise is, is fantastic, and, you know, working at UNLV, it's great because we can uh, tap into that, so... That's I all. appreciate the opportunity. I love this conversation and I'd love to hear everyone's feedback and what questions they have so we can tailor this more to you guys um, in the future. Great. Well, let's set up another one of these. This, uh, we'll, we'll post, we'll, I'll talk with you about dates and times and uh, we'll get another one going. That sounds great, guys. All right. Thank great. you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ted. You're welcome. Thanks, Nicole. That's really great. All right. I am stopped the live stream.